Alhamdulillah, we are back. We will now proceed to our second speaker. Our second speaker is a consultant neonatologist practicing physician and the director of pediatric designated inst institutional officials for KFAFH supervising all accredited training program. She is the assistant hospital director for Academic Affair Research and Training Center at King Fahad Military Hospital, Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. She had her MBBHC in Ain Shams Medical School, Cairo, Egypt. She obtained her diploma in child health at the Royal College of Physicians of London, UK. She also passed both the Arab Board of Pediatrics and American Board of Pediatrics. She had her fellowship in perinatal neonatal medicine in Cornell Medical School, USA. She took up her executive master's in public health program and health services management in Columbia University School of Public Health. She was given a certificate as instructor in evidence medicine by the Healthcare Quality Certification Board and a certificate also as instructor on patient experience professional in the American Institute for Healthcare Quality. She has a professional diploma in clinical leadership at the Royal College of Surgeon. For her trainings, she graduated her residency training in pediatrics at King Fahad Military Hospital, Jeddah, and her clinical fellowship in pediatrics at the Institute of Child Health and Hospital for Sick Children. She passed the Arab Board Program in Pediatrics. She also had her clinical and research training in neonatology at the New York Medical College and her fellowship in neonatal perinatal medicine and her executive master in public health program and health services management at Columbia University School of Public Health, New York. She is a member of the American Academy and European so Society of Pediatrics, American Academy of Pediatrics Perinatal Section, and European Society. To talk about the patient's experience in healthcare system, it is with such honor that I welcome Dr. Mai Abu Saud. Uh, welcome, Dr. Mai. Welcome, uh, Dr. Maryam. Salam alaikum. Alaikum assalam. It gives me a great pleasure to be among you. It's um, very, I'm really excited, and I hope this is the beginning of uh, of a wonderful series of uh, Islamic medical, uh, you know, conf uh, conference and lectures. Thank you very much. And I'd like to thank uh, to thank Dr. Abdullah Judy for the invitation and Dr. Zain as well. So thank you. So should I start? Yes. All right. I need my slides again. <laughs> Okay, um, thank you. My name is May Abu Saud, and my talk is about uh, you know the patient experience. Um, can I move it? Yeah. Okay. So uh, what I'm going to talk about is uh, what is the patient experience and how is it measured and how can we make a difference? Um, I think there is a lot now in the literature um, on about patient experience. So next, please. So patient experience uh, by the NIH, which is the National Institute of Health in 2013, is the process of receiving care, is how the process uh, of receiving care feels like for your patient. And next. Um, and by the IOM, Crossing the Quality Chiasm, which was really a great work in 2001, it's the care that is respectful of and responsive to individual patient preferences, needs, and values, and ensure that patient values guide all clinical decisions. Next. So uh, patient experience, it's actually in uh, compasses the range of interaction that patients have with the healthcare system, including their care from health plans, from doctors, nurses, staff in hospitals, or physician practices and other 
healthcare facilities. Next, please. So how does it differ from the patient satisfaction? Because, you know, everybody's saying, so like, what's the big deal? We've been doing patient satisfaction before. So why now we're talking about patient experience? So the patient experience is more of a direct experience of specific aspect of treatment or care. While the patient satisfaction, it's just an evaluation of a wrap up of all without really any specification. So it doesn't really reflect, you know, what the patient, um, you know, kind of challenges that he or she have to go through. Can we go back to the slides, please? Okay. So the difference between the two is, you know, one looks at the process and the other looks at the outcome. So the outcome is measured maybe by the patient satisfaction. But what we are interested in is the process is, you know, uh, you know, because we want to know, I mean, yeah, well, the outcome, maybe it wouldn't really vary, but if the process is in place and it's actually applicable, and um, then that, that is very important from quality point of view. So it's also the difference between needs and expectations. Next, please. So in order, so it's just more than satisfaction. In order to meet the needs of patients, we need to recognize their interdependency among the safety, quality, and patient experience of care. Overall, patient experience depends on consistency, consistency, uh, consistently delivering safety, quality, empathy, employee engagement. And it really reflects what type of organization it is. So if it's a high reliability organization that put the patient as the center of its, you know, of its existence, then most probably that would meet the highest expectation of patient experience. Next, please. So in short, the, um, according to the Viral Institute, um, you know, it's actually a patient experience is the sum of all the interaction shaped by an organization culture that influence patients' perception across the continuum of care. Next. So now patient experience is becoming a growing hospital priority. And you know, the, still there is no consensus on the definition from hospital leaders on what it means. So 34%. Um, you know, um, they think that it's more of a patient-centered care. And 29, um, they see it as an orchestrated set of meaningful activities. Um, and it is, you know, kind of customized for each patient. 23%, they provide excellent customer service. And 14%, creating a healing environment which is consistent with what is being measured. Next, please. So according to the uh, American Institute for Healthcare Quality, what is the call of, goal of patient experience is to provide an exceptional patient and family experience. Next. So what is exceptional? Is it from our point of view or is it from the patient point of view? So ideally it should be from our customers. And I used to hate the word customers because, you know, we are, you know, it's kind of a different, you know, a relationship between doctor and patient. But, you know, what is important for the patient? The outcome that matters to the patient, the ability to communicate effectively, um, delivering the patient-centered care, understanding of the health literacy. Sometimes we use big words and, you know, we're sure that our patients did not really understand what we are saying. Engaging patients and families in the conversation uh, that identify outcome that matters to the patient and engaging them in decision-making. You know, this paternal attitude towards medicine is not there anymore. Uh, before in the past, you know, physicians were, you know, kind of, okay, I'm gonna make the decision and, you know, that's it, that's what we're gonna do. I mean, we're a different era, you know, and it shouldn't really be like that. We should, it should be a type of a partnership um, between our patient. And we, if, even if we think, oh, but the patient do not understand, hey, you know, guys, come on. They are the one with the disease. They are the one that they have to face all the consequences, all the care. And if they're not engaged and they don't understand what's going on, then, of course, they're not going to follow. And, you know, the outcome was not is not going to meet where we are planning to go. So next, please. 
Next. Yes. So it's very important for us to know what patients actually want. So what do they want? Next. They want somebody to, excuse me, next, please. They want somebody to listen to them, to listen to what's their problems, you know, what are the, uh, the what, uh, you know, what are the issues exactly that they are facing. And of course, you know, we need to focus on the relevant as well. Next, they need as well what is important for the patient. It might not be important for us from the medical point of view, but that thing is very important, you know, for the patient. So we need really to address it as well. Next. And what is addressing the patient's needs first, not what we feel is our need, because, you know, it's, it's our center, the center of our existence in the healthcare profession is the patient. And that's where the need of the patient comes first. Next, please. And what should be our priority? And it's our priority. It's not the physician priority. It's a combined decision between the doctor and the nurses. Next, please, uh, doctors, nurses, and the patient. And it's about giving choices, you know, and this is really the worst thing because if you are deprived from having a choice, okay, you know, you're gonna, this is the treatment plan and this is the only thing is available. To, but if it's not meeting the patient accessibility even for, for, you know, for the treatment, we can't say, well, this is, this is it, take it or leave it. You know, it's always good to be given options. Next, please, and choices. So in summary, what do patients want? They want a fast access to a reliable health service, effective treatment delivered by professionals, participation in decision and respect, a clear comprehensive information and support for self-care and continuity of care. Next, please. So... What they want, they want their, the care that's provided to be centered around them, around dignity, respect, information sharing, participation, and collaboration. And this is where the concept came from, patient-centered care. Next, please. And being a neonatologist, I think, you know, we think just because we have a smaller customers, which are the preemies, but we're dealing with the family, with the parents. And, you know, parents feel so helpless in the intensive care unit because they are deprived of even holding the baby. They have no control on whatever goes on there. But, you know, we have to start a journey because sometimes it's quite a long journey with the parents and the parents, they should know, they should participate. We should enable them as well, enable them to perform some of the activities that it's important, like kangaroo care, like, you know, breastfeeding, feeding, you know, at, you know, taking their opinion in, you know, and if there is and an choices of the care that um, should be given for the preemie as well. Next, please. So understanding patient experience can be achieved through a range of activity that capture direct feedback from patients, services, users, um, and the communities. And also, um, it is used alongside information on clinical outcome to change the way local services are designed and reshaped in order to, you know, meet the, you know, the end user need. Next, please. So it has, you know, a lot of uh, responsibility lies at different level in any organization. So, you know, organizational level, leadership at the chief executive and board level it has to be you know they have to be engaged they have to be committed to you know to actually delivering a, a patient centered care where patient experience is the most important and the patient satisfaction or patient is the center of the institution or it's the top priority it should be part of the strategic vision. It should be involvement of patient and families are on board, supportive work environment for the staff, because, you know, um, you know, happy staff, they're going to provide a happy service. But if the staff is not, you know, they're not really, they're not satisfied and they have a lot of stresses, they're not going to be able to deliver, you know, an excellent care. Systemic measurement and feedback, quality of the built environment and supportive technology. Next, please. 
So this is at the organizational level. Now, what about about the healthcare provider level? Compassion, empathy, and we're going to talk about that and responsiveness to the needs, values, and express preferences. Coordinating and integration, which is, you know, unfortunately, the physician are not so good in coordination and integration. And uh, you know, my, uh, you know, my uh, great admiration is for our for the nursing colleague, our nursing colleague, because they actually coordinate and integrate better than the physician. And I think that that should be really started early on in the medical school because I think we're trained as being individualistic and egocentric. And I think with the present health situation and need and demands and, you know, it's not me and the patient anymore, it's a whole team. And so it has to be learned for the physician how to coordinate and integrate, to communicate and, you know, to look at the physical comfort, emotional uh, support of the uh, patient and involvement of the family and friend as well. Next, please. So, you know, the patient experience is actually part of, you know, patient safety. It's part of the clinical effectiveness. And next, please. And the effect usually, um, it has a, a good effect on the clinical outcome and it improves the communication. So compliance in taking the medication, greater self-management for patients with chronic diseases and decrease the anxiety and fear that actually delay healing and also delay compliance as well. Next, please. And also it has a financial advantage as well because poor patient experience can be costly. Uh, there is, uh, can be costly. There is, uh, there might, might be a communication failure, you know, there be compliance, uh, you know, there, there are going to be complaints and, you know, the litigation cost is quite high. It's not only in the U.S., even in, in um, our country, it's becoming uh, a problem as well. Eviden evidence of uh, an association with excellent patient experience and market performance and financial health of providers as well is very important as well. Next, please. So designing a service excellence strategy with analytics, uh, um, I would like really to discuss with you the Cleveland experience because um, Cleveland Clinic, as it's well known, it's one of the um, renowned institution for, you know, for cardiac, but it's not exclusively for cardiac. And they are one of the best hospitals. But in 2009, the Cleveland Clinic ranked among the lowest for physician communication with patients. And the major problem was in their ER. So the organization conducted a robust quantitative and qualitative study to see exactly what patient wanted. Next, please. And, you know, um, based on, um, you know, on involving a third party to do a questionnaire, you know, what, what was the problem that, you know, patients want respect, okay, they want empathy, they want communication, and they need a happy provider, okay, so that, you know, that happy provider can be approachable. Next, please. And it's really amazing because, you know, when they had a meeting with the ER physician and the healthcare staff, you know, they, the healthcare staff, physicians and admin, they attributed the poor, um, you know, kind of uh, feedback on patient experience in, for, in the ER because of the waiting time, because, you know, they have to wait for hours and hours in the ER. And that's why, you know, patients are not happy. But Amazingly, if you look at the scale of importance that came for patient satisfaction, that came back from questioning the patients. You see, all of them the most important about the caring of the staff, the communication, the explanation, the pain control, the courtesy, the respect, and waiting time was not of that important for the patient if they receive what is more important, which is the communication. So even if you are waiting in the ER and you know that 
people are coming, you know, healthcare professionals are coming and checking on you and explaining to you what you have to wait. You know, your um, your kind of triage score is four or five. So, you know, there are more sicker patients that we need to, um, you know, to deal with them. Please, could you just wait? Uh, anything I can do for you, check their vitals again and so on. That would break the ice and actually, you know, patients, they do understand. Next, please. So as a result, the organization piloted an, an initiative where everybody in the emergency department was taught to communicate with each patient during their wait. For example, the janitor sweeping the hallway near the patient might say, I know you've probably been here a long time. Is there anything I can get? I can get you. And guess what? The patient experience scores suddenly went up. And actually, the CEO of Cleveland is one of the great speaker. And actually, um, you know, he's one of the best CEOs based on their patient experience and, you know, what they have done to improve it. Next, please. So patient first at the center of everything. This is important. And the hospital need to focus on that. And they need to focus that not maybe not everything I can fix it, but, you know, I, I, you know, the things that matter to, to patients, I, you know, I, I'll try to make them zero, zero as they, you know, the things that bother them, they should be zero. Next, please. So, um, you know, engage and passionate leader, five key drivers for uh, the patient experience is engage and passionate leadership, safe patient and family focused care, compassionate, uh, competent caregiver, alliant stakeholder, and reliable care and business process. Next, please. So achieve zero harm is very important. We have to have deliver a safe environment, uh, deliver high value care, an optimal patient and family experience, and understand and adapt reliability as an operating system in the healthcare. You know what? Next, please. Let me just share with you uh, with you, one of the things that um, was really bothering me for quite some time, you know, hospital acquired infection, you know, in the past, it used to be, well, you know what, this is part of hospitalization. I mean, it can't be zero. But since the insurance company decided in the West, decided that it's preventable, we're not going to pay for it. And guess what? Hospitals and institutes start reporting zero hospital acquired infection. I mean, I mean, the, the financial incentive led to zero harm. And um, I don't know whether we always need this financial incentive to perform better. Anyway, can we go back to the slide, please? So design and implement healthcare work processes to reflect evidence-based best practices and influence and reinforce behavior accountability of individuals, team, and organizations. Next, please. So now, does it really reflect on, on, you know, on actually outcome? This is always, you know, people are asking, okay, you're telling us one time satisfaction, and now it is, you know, patient experience. How does it translate into reality? We, as a healthcare worker, we like to see you know, outcomes. And actually, this is one, Wang et al. It was um, in uh, the JAMA in 2016, where they actually um, assessed 2,434 hospitals for mortality results and 2,430, um, you know, hospitals for readmission. And, you know, the star rating is, you know, the rating uh, by based on the patient experience. So five is the highest. And you could see, you know, the assessment of the mortality rate and the readmission rate for the five is much lower compared to the first, and also the readmission rate in the um, in the uh, rating five that was given by based on the patient experience showed readmission rate lower than the others. So it, it has a value and it has, you know, an effect on the outcome. Next, please. And um, patient experience is positively associated with clinical effectiveness and patient safety. Positive association was seen in uh, 429 studies, 77.8%. No association in 
127 studies, 22%, and negative association in one study, only 0.2%. Next, and this is in 2013, British Medical Journal. Next, please. So it improves patient satisfaction, decreases patient, patient emotional stress, improves adherence and compliance, improves health outcome, reduces medical errors and malpractice, which is very important, and improves physician satisfaction because if my patients are happy and they are well, then of course um, that would reflect in a positive way on me as well. Next, please. And, you know, um, uh, there is uh, the, the the I think the most difficult um, a group of patients to deal with uh, is you know the 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 chronic um, you know the chronic diseases the patients that they have a multimorbidity. So um, nice uh, guidance uh, have uh, produced uh, nice uh, have reduced guidance in 2016 about how to do the clinical assessment and the management of the multi-morbid patients. And it recommends establishing the patient's burden of disease and treatment according to their value and their priority, review their medication, agreeing on individualized management plan, a plan. And the central aim of this approach was to allow patients to actively participate in their care, ensure service met their need, and improve continuity of care and relationship and improve the patient quality of life. Next, please. And um, you know it was um, it was measured um, by NIHR evidence that was published in 2018, and it showed that uh, the implementation of Nice guidance has led to comprehensive uh, had led to a better improve in patient experience uh, of care, uh, but it didn't have you know an effect on the quality of life, and maybe it was because of the intervention was not delivered at a full dose. So there is a pending updated Cochrane review that hopefully will see a more positive correlation, not only on the patient experience. Next, please. So patient, is, uh, patient experience is important because that's the right thing to do, the ethics of profession. And, um, you know, as we said, that it really affects the outcome. Um, and it gives as well cost effectiveness, uh, and also it gives a good reputation for the organization. Next, please. And with a positive motivation, you know, for the staff. And uh, especially now we have the value-based purchasing. I know it's uh, in the U.S. only, but it's really spreading all over. Um, so, um, soon it will be tied with the reimbursement. Next, please. So a lot of uh, organization now, they start to work on their, um, you know, accessibility, on their registration, uh, on their, you know, even food menu, um, on, uh, you know, keeping the uh, patient informed um, during their visit. Next, please. And that really improved you know, communication and the effective communication should include, as um, you know, the uh, professor before me was saying, acknowledge uh, the person, introduce yourself, um, um, you know, duration of waiting, explanation, and then you thank the, the patient and also perform rounding, which is very important for the leadership. Next, please. Um, the cleanliness, the quietness, um, you know, the medication communication, the doctor communication, the nurse communication, pain management and discharge planning are very important in transition of care from hospital to home. Next, please. Okay, so engagement is really the key point in improving, um, you know, patient experience and it it has an effect on outcome, whether engagement of the staff or engagement of patients. Next, please. Okay, so if we, if we, okay, if we, uh, for example, look at the patient family centered care here, we find that it's, you know, there is an effect on the process, environment, and procedure, uncertainty, and anxiety. There are, if you can move to the next, please. 
Okay, so we find that all these important factors can be, uh, have been addressed recently. Next, please. By experience-based co-design, which means what? Which means that the patients are part of, uh, they are involved in redesigning a process. For example, I want to uh, redo the, uh, out, uh, the day surgery. I mean, there is a, a lot of problems. People are not coming on time. We're losing a lot of time and so on. So if you are involved, the end user as well, the patients, you might be able to get a, a better process redesign. And this is uh, this um, the experience-based co-design has uh, been, you know, approached and has been implemented in, uh, it started in the UK and, um, you know, and it started more in the head and neck cancer services in England in 2005, but then it spread all over um, many institutions now uh, are using it. And they are following that, you know, setting up, engaging the staff and gathering experiences, engaging the patients and gathering experiences co-design meeting where the two ends will meet and they discuss a small key design team and then you know you get the process redesigned or even the building uh, you know new hospitals uh, um, even a new uh, wings you know has been actually they use the co-design by asking the patients next please now is there an evidence for it and um, as you know uh, we, we always have to look uh, at evidence base well um, Experience-based co-design, there has been so many articles, 20 studies, but the problem with those studies that they were, um, you know, that they did not share the same processes. So it was very difficult to make a conclusion whether it has an effect on the outcome um, uh, or not. But, uh, but according to the conclusion, um, you know, it's useful quality in improvement has potential to be used for intervention design project but there is no consistency in reporting and it's something that you know it needs to be um, worked on next please patient right is important and it should be really um, available uh, it should be um, you know taught to all the newcomer to the hospital uh, to a new uh, hospital staff and it's, it should be hanged all over um, uh, the uh, the organization Next, please. And, uh, you know, there is a measurement tool uh, for, you know, the patient, uh, um, you know, patient experience. Usually it's given to, uh, I think there is a slide before that, but it's, uh, you know, how to measuring, the measuring tool for, uh, for uh, uh, patient experience. Uh, you, we use uh, multiple questions that this is sent by a third party um, the third party is now is Presgeni, which is using it. It's uh, in the um, it's um, um, internationally. Uh, people are using their um, you know their services, and they are using um, a multiple question that it's sent. Can we um, can we see the next slide, please? Um, you know, which is for example one of the questions during this hospital stay after you press the call button. How often did you get help as soon as you wanted? it never sometimes usual always so you know the patient would answer that and that would go to the third party and then the third party will analyze the data and will send it to the organization next please so how can we make a difference um you know we, we think it's important it has an effect how can we make a difference next please by something we thought to that as physician as healthcare provider we have which is the empathy. Next. Um, you know, we need really to go through this because in the past we used to talk about sympathy and then we moved to empathy and compassion. What is the difference? From patient's point of view, um, according to Soto um, Sinclair in 2018, sympathy has come to be understood by patients as an unhelpful, pity-based response that often exer um, ex exacerbate their suffering. So it doesn't really, oh, I'm sympathizing with you, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't give a reflection that I'm gonna do something about it. While empathy, it involves acknowledgement and understanding of a person's situation and feeling through an emotional resonance. And compassion is a virtuous response that seeks to address the suffering and needs of person through 
re, uh, through relational understanding and action. All is actually based in our religion and uh, it's based on our teaching. And uh, we don't need anybody to tell us about it, but I think we need a reminder every now and then. Next, please. So empathy is an essential to the quality healthcare. Empathy also helps those of us who are privileged to work in healthcare setting because it is a privilege to be in a healthcare, working in a healthcare visiting uh, uh, services to know and support each other. Next, please. And empathy is fundamental to many moral systems, yet empathy can be expensive and often entailing material and emotional cost. And trying to share in others' feeling was experienced as a cognitive struggle leading to empathy avoidance. And that's what we see now in the health system. We see that there is, you know, you, 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 you don't want to be empathic, empathetic with the patient because that's, that's costly. It's not costly only financially, but it's costly emotionally. You get so much involved, you, you know, you, you know, it kind of affects you personally. So you, you just, you know, block it and you don't want to deal with it. So you avoid it. And that affects, you know, what kind of care you deliver for your patient. Next, please. And this is interesting because this is from Camerton Italian in 2019, and they actually analyzed, uh, you know, the, the empathy scores and they found and the empathy avoidance from several studies and they uh, for the healthcare provider and they um, and the net um, net results were like, yes, I mean, there is an overall tendency to avoid empathy. Next, please. And you can measure empathy. There is, you know, a questionnaire, 60 items um, that is sent. And then, um, you know, you can be scored um, out of, I think, um, out of 80. And, uh, you know, there is a score if you are above, uh, you know, sorry, uh, if you are at 100, if you are above 80, then you're empathetic. Then if not, then you, you need to work on it, I guess. Next, please. But you know what? I found this um, a study, this article, because that was in my mind. Okay, I mean, how was it with the COVID-19? We've just recovered from COVID-19. And we've heard a wonderful story about healthcare worker, how they went out of their way to support their patients. So there has to be, empathy has to be still there. And that study came from Ecuador, where actually they measure the, they studied the um, you know, professionals and the student of the uh, social health field in Ecuador, they met, measure their empathy and they found that, you know, the empathy was high, but empathy is a double edged word, uh, sword. So it's essential to establish an adequate helping relationship. But at the same time, it might induce an emotional over involvement, emotional exhaustion. And the lack of empathy balance can lead to a negative professional practice consequences, such as the burnout, the depression post-traumatic stress. So, um, so you know what, sometimes it, it's kind of difficult. I think some of the healthcare worker avoid it because of the sequences that they are, maybe they don't get enough support to deal with it. So that's why it's important, you know, for organization to take care of its own staff, measuring their burnout and even doing assessment for the empathy. And if it was really high, they need to support the staff in order to continue um, the, the good thing that they are doing. Next, please. So what are the patients telling us from this, uh, you know, from this questionnaire? A lot of things. They tell us about the cleanliness. They tell how wonderful the nurse is, the housekeeper, and if they're professional and excellent. Next, please. And, you know, they put these as you need to smile, you need to offer help, listen. Next, please. But you know, some of the healthcare worker, they're a bit skeptical about that. And they say, well, you are not McDonald's. We're not in the business of doing nice thing. We're in the business of doing the right thing. And I'm sure you, you know, a couple of our healthcare providers who, who, you know, think this way and have this attitude. Next, please. But why can't we why can't we be in the business of doing the nice right thing? And I think 
yes, we can. And I think during COVID-19, it showed the real, um, you know, the, the real, um, the real healthcare worker uh, uh, compassion and empathy. Next, please. Okay, so what we will do to make a positive impact on the patient experience. Next, please. Next. So at our hospital, we are measuring the patient experience as well as staff satisfaction. Next, please. And uh, these are the patient experience that we get. We used a third party, which is Fresgeni, and you can see um, you know, the inpatient and the outpatient. So apparently the outpatient, we need to work on it and we discuss it um, you know, in our meetings um, uh, for opportunity for improvement. Next, please. As well as the ER visit, the ER visit, um, you know, kind of improved and then became stagnant a bit. And the family visit has um, improved as well, um, but then became stagnant again. Next, please. And all this information is really important because it gives us a, if a measuring point where we actually can come with solutions and discuss with our end users, discuss with the whole staff and it becomes our business in order to improve it. Next, please. And equally important is the staff satisfaction. Um, I think staff satisfaction is, is very important because you have to have a happy customer, uh, a happy uh, worker in order to have a happy customer. Next, please. And these are some of the comments that we get from our patients. You know, I mean, it's in Arabic. So they talk about, uh, for example, the security. They uh, express that the room is cold, uh, you know, the nurse's attitude, the doctor's attitude, you know, some of the excellent physician, what they have done. And, uh, you know, an overall experience, you know, sometimes we don't like what we see or what we what they are telling us. But, you know, it's a very important point because based on this, we have done a lot of you know, intervention. Next, please. And this is what we do. I mean, and now there is a great project to look into the work culture. Um, communication, we started doing communication sessions, uh, you know, workshops for everybody. We started with, uh, uh, you know, with the receptionist, uh, with the, um, you know, with the security, with, uh, you know, housekeeping, of course, the uh, healthcare worker as well. Um, embrace more teamwork. We establish the leader round and establish an organizational shared mental model. So where the center of all is the patient. Next, please. Okay. And in order to pass the right message, what we did, we developed a, a video uh, that uh, um, actually shown on all the screen of the hospital and it was um, you know we did it before the COVID so you don't see a lot of uh, mask there um, and it just you know kind of um, you know kind of give the message to everybody that um, you know patient experience is everybody's business um, so I'd like to share with you the video at the end <laughs> 